Palestine, a land divided, a holy place, a battleground, a homeland claimed by both Arabs and Jews. By 1947, the lines were drawn. To the Jews, Palestine is their traditional and spiritual home, the promised land. But the majority of the inhabitants of Palestine are Arabs. They too regard Palestine as their rightful home. But with the end of the war, into Palestine ports came ship after ship crammed with illegal immigrants, refugees from recent persecution in Germany, Austria, Poland, Belsen and Dachau. The Arabs, fearful of becoming a minority, persuaded the British to limit Jewish immigration. Jewish extremists attacked British troops, wrecked government buildings, blew up trains and ships. And so Palestine remains a place of martial law, where all go their ways only under watch, where the innocent must suffer with the guilty. Great Britain had ruled Palestine for three decades. After years of strenuous but unavailing effort, His Majesty's government has reached the conclusion that they are not able to bring about a settlement in Palestine based upon the consent of both Arabs and Jews, and that the mandate is no longer workable. A York transport landing at Leda Airport brings delegates to the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. The UN committee considered the partition of Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. But the Arabs did not want to talk to the committee. They wanted nothing to do with the Jews. Sabri ad was an honorable sheikh and an eloquent speaker. And he said, if the Jews want to take Palestine from us, we swear that we will throw them into the sea. And he pointed to the Mediterranean, which was a few hundred meters from the place where we had gathered. The Arab leadership believed that if a partition was imposed, they could reverse it by force. Jamal Husseini, the chairman of the Arab Higher Committee, said that only four to five hundred riflemen can easily take over Tel Aviv. While the committee was still in Palestine, a ship called Exodus arrived in Haifa, loaded with Jewish Holocaust survivors. But now she had on board some 5,000 Jews who'd hoped to enter Palestine illegally. When she was boarded at sea by the Navy, a fierce battle was fought on her decks, resulting in many casualties on both sides. The UN committee saw firsthand the immigrants' despair when they were forced to return to Europe. The Jews argued that refugees needed a home and that they would not be welcomed by an Arab state. The UN committee agreed. They recommended that Palestine be partitioned when the British pulled out. We felt that what had happened to the Palestinians was unjust, and that the division of Palestine was not fair. The Arabs were outraged. We had a man called Mustafa Mu'min, who managed to penetrate literally into the circle of the Security Council to read a letter written in the blood of some, several thousand Egyptian Muslim brothers denouncing Israel and, uh, and the support of Israel and so on. You all know how to vote. Those who are in favor will say yes, those who are against will say no. The 
No one relied on the calculations made by the president of the assembly. Each person held his own pencil and piece of paper and calculated whether or not there was two-thirds for the partition or not. The United Kingdom, abstain. The United States, yes. Uruguay, yes. Venezuela, and towards the end, during the last countries, USA, Venezuela, etc., we found there was two-thirds. We jumped from our places with joy. We wept, we hugged, we kissed. The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. I was glad, I was very glad, because for me it was important that the UN, according to the decree of nations, was giving, granting the Jews, I'd say the Zionists, an independent country on the land of Israel. And I thought in my heart, history is turning a huge page. The news was broadcast at 8 p.m. The Palestinian people listened to it everywhere, and there was this feeling of frustration and sadness, a feeling of catastrophe which was about to befall Palestine. Riots and demonstrations started everywhere. The Arabs attacked Jews and the Jews hit back. Cities and neighborhoods were divided along religious lines. In Jerusalem, an Arab car bomb destroyed the Jewish agency offices. Seven were killed, more than a hundred wounded. The Fifty Years' War was underway. Palestinian forces from towns and villages along the road to Jerusalem were commanded by Abdul Qader El Husseini. They blocked supplies going from Jewish-held Tel Aviv to a besieged Jerusalem. Keeping the Jews of Jerusalem supplied was the first priority of the Jewish army, the Haganah. They tried to defend the convoys. It was very hard to protect the convoys. We had a huge number of casualties among the convoy escorts, and there was a big waste of product. When a convoy got through, the whole city knew. The trucks brought vital supplies flour. We really needed matches. And cigarettes. Can you imagine soldiers without cigarettes? We were kept alive by the convoy from Tel Aviv. We started with uh, military operations to make sure that the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem will not be endangered by the big villages or towns that were along the road, uh, where from came all the attackers on the convoys. A special Haganah brigade was formed to open the road to Jerusalem. The system was to attack the village, to give warning to the civilians, to destroy the village, and by the elimination of the villages alone and adjacent to the road, we were sure that there would be no attacks. The Jews tried to seize Castel, a village controlling the road to Jerusalem. It was a Palmach unit, my troops, that captured the Castel. And it was here that Abdel Qadir el Husseini, the Palestinian leader, was killed. Enraged, Husseini's soldiers went to recover the body of their leader. 
The Arabs counterattacked. Our reinforcements were wiped out. It was a very black day.